Hey guys, today we're going to read chapters 14 and 15. When we left off, um, we found out why Albert was there by himself, why his sister Ruth wasn't with him. Um, when they were in France, she had to stay behind because one of the nuns found out that she had measles and they didn't want it to spread because it's pretty contagious. So chapter 14. <clears throat> it was late on Monday night. Still in shorts and a shirt, Lily lay under her red quilt looking up at the sky. She could see Orion's belt and the W of Cassiopeia. They were sharp and clear among the other stars in the dark sky. It was a beautiful night, and finally she and Albert were going to watch for convoys. She thought about it a little uneasily. They hadn't talked about Lily's going to Europe since that day at the beach. Maybe he had forgotten, she told herself, or maybe he had thought it over by now and knew she had been lying. She turned in the bed, trying to put it out of her mind. Everything was ready for tonight, on the floor. A sweater, two towels, her sneakers tucked in one side of her beach bag, and two bottles of soda jammed into the other side. If only Grandma would go to sleep. Vaguely, she heard Graham's radio, the end of Lux Radio Theater, and then music. Would you like to swing on a star? The music asked. She couldn't keep her eyes open. Then suddenly, she was awake. Wide awake. It seemed very late. Midnight, maybe one o'clock. Graham's radio was off and all the lights. Lily reached for the screen and pushed it up and out. She dropped into the rowboat and pushed herself along under the porches. In the black light that spilled out from the sides of Mrs. Colgan's blackout shades, she could see a mess of sand crabs hanging onto the pilings. And at the Orbans, just silence. She sat there as wide awake as if it were the middle of the morning, so angry with herself for sleeping, so disappointed Albert was asleep she could have cried. Too much crying, she said aloud. Too much talking to yourself, a voice said so close she jumped. Albert dropped into the boat. He was clumsy and splashed water in over the side. Because of the cat, he said. She leaned over until she could see the cat's face, his eyes peering out from the front of his open jacket. Cats hate the water. This one does not. I thought you would not come. She opened her mouth, ready to lie, but raised one shoulder instead. I fell asleep. Albert nodded. It is hard to stay awake sometimes. Lily pushed the boat out from under the porches. Here's what we'll do. We'll cut across the bay. That way we can stay away from the surf. But it is closer the other way. Yes, but it's harder to fight the surf than the bay. If you're going far, you want to save your arms. He nodded, watching her pull on the oars. Will you teach me to swim, he asked after a while. She blinked. She had been thinking again about Poppy. Poppy on a troop ship, watching her swim toward him. It was a wonderful dream. Swim, she repeated. Yes, but why can't you swim? I did not have an ocean, he said, like Margaret in Detroit, she thought. I had a river, the Danube, he leaned forward. It runs between Buddha and Pest, but the river is not blue like the waltz. It is gray and sometimes silver. Lily didn't say anything. She had never heard of Budapest split up that way in two halves. She'd heard of the blue Danube, though. It was one of the songs in her music book for that piano. <clears throat> it was hard to row now. The marshes were closing in around them, and there was the dry rustle of the reeds hitting the sides of the boat and scraping the bottom. She could see Playland now in back of them on 99th Street, the roller coaster, a dark skeleton, and the Ferris wheel rising up behind it. In front, the boardwalk was misty, the tall lights painted black toward the sea so German subs couldn't spot ships in the water nearby. How long? Albert asked. Long? To learn to swim, he leaned forward. I want to go with you to Europe. She opened her mouth. Tell him right now you were lying, she told herself. Tell him it's just too far. The water's too rough. Lily, she sighed. You could never learn to swim the Atlantic in a summer. It would take months, years to be good enough, fast enough. If you can do it. I've been swimming since I was four, she said. And remember that afternoon when I went into the surf after you, I was nearly swept under. He didn't answer. She took a breath, trying to think of something to convince him. You even said you thought I was a better swimmer. In the dark, she could just see him shaking his head. I know you are a good swimmer, he said slowly. I know you were coming for me. <clears throat> he stopped for a moment. I was, I don't know the word. How could she tell him the truth now? He was the first friend she had ever made. You couldn't count Margaret. Margaret, who had been in Rockaway every summer from the time they could walk, from the time they could talk. Albert, a friend, a good friend, Lily's best friend. Teasing is the word, he said. She looked at him. His face was so serious. One hand was in his jacket, petting the sleeping cat. You do not want to take me, he said. You think I will not be able to keep up. 
No, it isn't that, really, she said. You think I am a coward because of the plane that day. She kept shaking her head. He leaned forward. It was just that I was thinking it was Europe. His lip trembled a little. In Budapest, we had a yellow house with birds. He moved his fingers. They were small birds, blue ones painted on the house, painted on the window shutters. I had an orange cat too. We called him Paprika after the pepper. He looks like this cat. He tried to smile. And my grandmother Najimamo was always telling me to do this and that like your grandmother. Lily bit her lip trying to think of what to say. I have only Ruth left. Ruth is my family. He stopped then and pointed. Look. She turned and saw it too. The first ship looked like a flat chunk of coal on the water. So far out, she wasn't even sure it was a ship. But then a second one appeared on the horizon, moving out of the mist. It was a huge ship, its top a tangle of turrets and masts. For a moment, they didn't say anything. They sat there watching, the rowboat rocking gently until the ship disappeared into the mist again. That was a troop ship, he said, she said at last. Albert leaned back. Yes, he said, I know. I will learn to swim, Lily, to keep up, and we will go out there, out to a ship, and then I will go back to Europe and find Ruth. She began to row again, turning the boat toward the canal, her mouth dry. <clears throat> okay, this is chapter 15. There were two letters the next day, one from Poppy and one from Margaret. Lily managed to pick them up from the mailman before he even hit Cross Bay Boulevard. She'd been waiting on the corner for more than an hour, watching the street as far down as she could see, wondering if Margaret had gotten the letter she had sent. She had told her about Albert and the cat he was calling Paprika. Lily yawned, tired from last night. Even after she had tiptoed through the dark kitchen at two or three in the morning and slipped under the red quilt again, she hadn't been able to sleep. She had tossed from side to side to, the, to one side to the other, thinking about the troop ship and Poppy and what she could possibly do about the lie she had told Albert. Now she took the letters and went straight to Margaret's house, past the bedroom where Paprika slept now, a small orange circle on Eddie's pillow. She climbed the attic stairs and shoved up the window as high as it could go and then took a quick look at the beach. It was still empty at this hour of the morning, litter baskets clean, the sand smooth and even. She had time, plenty of time. She wanted to stretch out this moment with two letters to read. It would be like sucking on a red lifesaver until it melted into a thin little circle. She looked at them both, Margaret's as filthy as the first letter she had sent. But this time it was an in ink that was blotted and watery as if drops had been spattered on it. Her father's letter was much neater, much cleaner, and his beautiful clear writing said Miss Elizabeth Mary Mollahan. Lily slid her fingernail under the flap and slid out the tissue paper letter. Lily, it began, my dearest daughter. She closed her eyes and held the letter her father had held in his own hands just a few days ago. She read the rest of it quickly, so fast the words ran together. He never mentioned that she hadn't said goodbye. He never said that he minded or didn't mind, only about the war being over and everything being the same again. I have a picture of you in my head as clear as a photograph to take with me overseas, daughter. You are in the boat and frowning, staring at a skatefish just before you set him free. By the time you read this, Lily Billy, I'll be on my way across the ocean. The faster there, the faster home. She thought her heart would stop. Her father out there? crossing the Atlantic, part of a convoy, maybe even on a troop ship C and Albert had seen last night. She couldn't even think about it. She looked at the end of the letter. Hug the waves for me and the beach on 101st Street. And then at the very bottom, hug Graham too. She loves you, Lily, more than you know. Lily wiped her eyes. It was a good thing she had Margaret's letter to think about next and not having to give Graham a hug. She looked back at Poppy's letter. At the very bottom, he had written, don't forget to finish those books, Madeline, and A Tale of Two Cities, and especially The Three Musketeers. Um, Lily frowned. Strange that Poppy had written that. He had read Madeline to her, Madeline to her a hundred years ago when she was six. How could he have forgotten? And he didn't know she was reading The Three Musketeers. She had just taken it from the library on Thursday. She put her father's letter down carefully near the chimney and opened Margaret's. It started out in the strangest way. No opening, the way Sister Eileen had taught Lily in school. No, dear Lily, just please go in the living room and get Eddie's picture. Send it right away, even if you have to ask your grandmother for the money. Tell her I'll pay her back when the war is over. I can't remember what Eddie looks like, and now he's missing in action. Isn't it strange? On a beach. It was on D-Day. 
The telegram didn't come until this morning. He never even got any of the candy. Margaret. Lily sat there for another minute, then she went down the stairs feeling so dizzy it seemed her feet didn't even touch the steps. She went into the Dylan's living room and reached for Eddie's picture. Her hands were shaking and she knocked it off the table, grabbing it before it hit the floor. Nice catch, Lily, Eddie would say. Then she was out the door and down the street. She couldn't wait to find Graham to tell her this awful thing that had happened to Eddie Dillon, to ask for wrapping paper and stamps for the picture. She went down the road and in the back door, but before she could begin, Graham had started. Change your clothes, Lily, and get your hat, she said. Mrs. Colgan told me that Eddie Dillon is missing, and how does she know, Lily asked. Graham put her hand up to her mouth. A phone call all the way from Willow Run to Mrs. Tannenbaum's candy store. We are on our way to church, a special mass, and we're going to pray as hard. She took a breath. We're all praying, I guess, the whole world that this will be over soon. She blinked back tears. And right now, we're going to pray for Eddie and your father and Albert's family and everyone who... She broke off. Lily put Eddie's picture on the table next to the couch and went onto the porch to find her Sunday clothes, even though it wasn't Sunday. Just 10 minutes later, she was walking into church, stopping for a quick dip of holy water and sliding into a pew next to Graham. As she knelt there and waited for Father Murphy to begin, the sun blasted around, blasted in around the partly open stained glass windows. It felt as if it must be 100 degrees. The fan in front didn't do any good. It just moved the fringe a little on the banner that hung over their heads. Father Murphy had hung the banner there himself. On its white background were rows of blue stars, one for each of the men from the parish who were in the service. There was one gold star in the middle. That was for a sailor who used to live near Cross Bay Theater. He had been killed at Pearl Harbor. And now in a day or two, there'd be a silver star for Eddie Dillon, who was missing, lost somewhere on a beach in France, and no one knew if they'd ever find him. Lily tried to imagine what it must feel like to be Eddie, to have been taken prisoner by the Germans, maybe, or just somewhere by himself, hurt. It was a desert in that church. She lifted the brim of her straw hat away from her head and fanned the air with her hymn, hymn book, watching Mrs. Orban come up the aisle with Albert until Graham gave her a poke. In a moment, Father Murphy was out on the altar beginning the mass, and Lily began to pray for Eddie and then for Poppy. She prayed for Albert's sister, too, and his grandmother. Next to her, Graham took her silver rosary beads out of their case, and on her other side, Mrs. Colbin opened her missile. Lily leaned back against the pew, thinking how thirsty she was. She was dying for a glass of orange soda or maybe a peach with juice dripping. If mass didn't end soon and she didn't get something to drink, Graham was looking at her, frowning, so she started to pray again. She prayed for everyone she could think of, even Sister Eileen. She looked at the stained glass window. Outside, everything was red or orange or yellow, and inside were the sounds of the fan whirring and feet shuffling. Maybe they'd find Eddie. Maybe he had just gotten mixed up and had to find his way back, or maybe they had made a mistake and some other Eddie was lost. She sat up straight. She had just thought of something. Eddie's picture. She had left it on the table next to the couch in the living room. How was she going to explain to Graham where she had gotten it? What would Graham say if she knew Lily had been in and out of the Dillon's empty house? Graham would say plenty. Lily would be in trouble for the rest of the summer, and she'd never get back into Margaret's house until the end of the war. She tried to figure out what to do. She could feel her heart pounding at the thought of Graham reaching for that picture when they got home. She wondered if Graham had seen her put it down. Graham always saw everything that she didn't want her to. But if she hadn't, if Lily could get to the living room first, she could grab up the picture and then, and then what? She didn't have a scent since the tan purse had sunk in the water. How was she going to send it? And right now, kneelers were banging back and people were standing. Mrs. White was playing the organ and everyone was singing, Holy God, we praise thy name. Lily edged herself out of the pew almost before they finished singing. See you, she whispered to Graham. And before Graham could answer, Lily had ducked ahead of Mrs. Colgan and the other people going down the aisle. She took another quick dip of holy water and raced for home.